A lot of times I can hear from various different players that I played today the best game I ever played. I think this was the greatest game uh, was ever played anywhere. I heard it many, many times from my friends who are, some of them are uh, 18, 1900 players, some of them are 23, 2400 players, some of them are 2,000 players, but when they say they play the best games, their criteria of the best game is fluctuates from, uh, from uh, uh, reality of what the best game is. Best game and great game is the game where you don't see just one simple beautiful combination and remember, beautiful combinations are not always very difficult one to perform. Beautiful, most spectacular combination may be easy to see, easy to find, but it still may be very fascinating and, uh, and uh, uh, exciting. So, what is the best game? What is my criteria of the best game? Best game is the game that was played very well from beginning to the end by some player and very important that had good level of uh, resistance. So if your opponent also played well and had good ideas, but your ideas and your play and uh, your thoughts prevail that's what makes it good game and of course level of a good game may be higher or lower and uh, that's but that's basically the criteria uh, well what is the level of resistance by your opponent no wonder when we talk about best games ever played you see a lot of big names world champions because world champions they do play against very strong players world champions don't play beginners unless they play in a simultaneous exhibition but when we see about the greatest ch games in chess you don't see the game from a simultaneous you may see this in a tactical part find a good combination and you see the good combination one, two or three or even ten move combinations but not the best games. Best games you see in the greatest players tournament games. One of these games I want to look at now is game between two world champions, formerly world champions, between Mikhail Botvinnik and Jose Capablanca. The game was played in 1938. Uh, it was organized by um, Dutch radio company Avro, AVRO, and uh, it was very, it was one of the strongest tournaments was ever played at that time. Botvinnik was white in this game and Capablanca was black. Very well known Nimtso Indian defense was, uh, which was not explored well enough then and ideas, modern ideas of this, for this opening are developed way, way after this game was played in 1938. Bishop before E3, D5. Now you don't see too many strong players playing d5 in today's tournament because this is invisible inaccuracy in this position. And after d5, Botvinnik played the correct move a3, bishop takes c3 and b takes c. Now this way, because black's pawn is on d5, white is guaranteed to have 
some pawn superiority in the center. They're going to take c takes d, which happened in the game. Black played c5, c takes d. You see, this position would have been a lot better for black if their pawn was on d7 and instead they played castle. Then they could have played b6, bishop a6, knight c6, knight a5, and maybe c5 to have pressure on white's weak pawn on c4. But what happened in the game, since d5 was played in this position, and black played c5, now white played cd, and black played ed. This pawn structure today is very well known as superior for white. They want to play, their plan is to play bishop d3 quickly, knight e2, knight g3, and after castle, try to make f3 and e4, which will give them a very strong center and very good chances for attack on the king side. So after c takes d and e takes d, white played bishop d3, now black has a problem uh, uh, the, uh, placing light square bishop anywhere. So if black goes bishop g4, then after f3, bishop h5, bishop does not stand very well on h5. So what happened in a game in this position, black simply castled, and after knight e2, black played b6. This move is understandable because Black wants to exchange light square bishop. You can see superiority of white's light square bishop uh, over the black's light square bishop. Now, let's talk a little bit about this dark square bishop of white. You may say this is a bad bishop. No, this is not a bad bishop. The bishop on c1 is a very good bishop. Because white wants to play f3, and while they play f3, they have to support the e3 pawn. Or possibly put the bishop on b2. When they play f3 and e4, bishop will be supporting their d4 pawn. So bishop on c1 is also very useful. So after b6, white castles, black plays bishop a6, white plays bishop takes a6, and the black plays knight takes a6. Now, here is little inaccuracy played by Botvinnik, bishop b2. We know the plan white has to play. White has to play queen d3, f3, and e4. So bishop on b2 and maybe rook a to e1. The, according to Gary Kasparov, a lot stronger move was queen d3, and bishop b2 is a mistake. That's not mistake because bishop on b2 stands badly. No, that's a mistake because uh, after what happened, bishop b2, black played queen d7. And uh, here, after queen d7, white went a4. Now they cannot play queen d3 because black places queen on a4, it's a very strong position for the queen, and maybe later queen on c4, blocks white's queen side. And now white has to play a4, and here Capablanca played another relatively weak move, rook f to e8. Well, when world champion plays rook e8, it's hard very hard to criticize when a world-class player plays rook e8. It's very hard to criticize him for this move, especially if what he does put, puts rook on semi-open file. But the correct continuation in this position, you see that white wants to play f3, queen d3, and make e4. The correct way to play this position was c takes d, c takes d, then play rook c8, and after queen d3, rook c4, 
and double rooks on c file, attacking a4 pawn at the same time. That didn't happen, and Capablanca played rook f to e8, and after queen d3, another serious mistake by black. Black played c4. Now, this position is very, very bad about c4. Capablanca then didn't know, uh, these positions were not known in chess as well as we do them now, as we know them now. Chess made a, a, a big progress, the knowledge and theory, and we know this. Basically, this is terrible pawn structure. I remember I played game and I even showed it on my uh, uh, combination uh, DVD on, about tactics. When I used the same idea, I used in the same pawn structure, I attacked with, uh, on a king side and it uh, ended with a beautiful combination. Well, it's not because I know it and Capablanca didn't know it because that happened, there was uh, at least 50 years uh, between those two games. So that's why at that time it was not known how bad this position uh, can be for uh, black. Queen c2, and now black tries to reposition the knight from a6. You see the knight on a6 is not doing well. Here, so he, where this knight is going to b8, c6, a5, and b3. Well, this is very interesting. For the time it was played in late 30s, there was a battle of ideas. Botvinnik has, with white, vision of performing movement on a king side and activating its extra pawn on a king side by playing rook e1, knight g3, and possibly f3, e4. Meanwhile, Capablanca tries to freeze white's queen side and take advantage of it. Knight b8, rook a e1, this is all planned moves, knight c6, knight g3, and knight a5. Black's knight heading towards b3, where it will be standing well. And after knight a5, f3, knight to b3, e4. We can tell, say here, that both sides uh, succeeded their plan. Uh, black won the a4 pawn and isolated white's b, b2 bishop, and white finally moved the central pawns and they have a threat of activating further pawn movement on a, in its center on a king side. And after queen takes a4, e5, knight d7, and queen f2. Now, uh, well, queen f2 is a good move and it's necessary move. For example, f4, which is is a planned move, you want to go f4, f5, and that's how you're going to get very strong attack on the king side. But f4 is inaccurate move. It, queen f2 is necessary. It's necessary to take the queen out. Here is the reason why. If white plays f4, black goes knight c5. And you see that knight on b3 does not stand well as far as it does stand okay, but not nearly as good as it will stand after knight c5. Obviously, white will not want to exchange queens because then their attack on the king side disappears, and if white moves the queen, knight goes to d3, and this is going to be very unpleasant piece for white. So what white does, white prevents knight c5 move by playing queen to f2. Now after queen f2, black plays g6. Now black has to do something. Black cannot allow 
white to play f4 and f5 because concentration of white pieces in the center and pawns on e5 and f5 will make black's position very difficult if not totally lost. So um, black plays g6 and after f4 black plays f5. Well, it's obviously that white cannot keep position closed and cannot let black to go knight f8 and knight to e6. So what white does, it plays ef, they have to open position, knight takes f6 and f5. Well, I have to tell you this, uh, if this game was played today, almost any master can do that because well they know what the general plan is they know what they have to do and they know all the uh, posi positional advantages and, and disadvantages for both sides because it's already been published known studied and it's like a formula now but at that time these players they have to figure it out all by themselves. Now, f take on f6, knight takes f6 and f5. This is very, very strong for white. And uh, black plays rook takes e1, rook takes e1, and rook to e8. Now you see that black wants to exchange second pair of rooks and then white's attack is not going to be so strong anymore. Now, um, well, here is the white's, white, uh, white's next move. It's rook e6. Now, let's talk about this position. If rook takes e8, then maybe knight takes e8. It's hard to see how white can get decisive attack on a king's side because most of the pieces disappeared. They need a rook to use on one of the open files. Rook is gone. So playing rook f1 may not be that, that good also because black can go g5 in position kind of blocked. And black, uh, dark sword bishop on b2 doesn't do much and white does not have any open files. So rook to e6 is a very strong move. Rook takes e6. Pawn takes e6, and knight on f6 is hanging, king g7, queen f4, and queen to e8. Um, obvious, well, here in this position, for example, move like queen a2, that would attack the bishop on b2, is not good because knight f5. This is decisive. Uh, because it's a forced mate. Now, if black takes queen g5 check, and black is going to get mated in three moves. Anywhere king goes, queen takes f6, and mate in two moves after that. So, um, clearly, black's queen has to go to e8 to defend their king. Now, and after queen e5, queen to e7. Okay. Here is the position that is critical for this game. Black managed to, estab uh, to establish some kind of blockade on a, a king side and blocking the e-pawn. Uh, here, this is the great position interesting position and interesting game as a battle of ideas. Whites, whites succeeded with their plan. They got very strong pass pawn, centralized queen, black's king is in trouble, black's knight is out of action. Black got their plan also. Black in a way also succeeded with their plan. They, they won a pawn, a pawn, they blockaded white's pawn, they isolated white's b2 bishop. Looks like they both had very logical plan 
when very um, uh, plan that makes a lot of sense. However, here is the, culmin uh, the climax of the game. And this shot, next shot by uh, White, was decisive. Bishop a3. Here, bishop that was isolated for most of the game, most part of the game, comes with decisive blow. Bishop a3, and uh, well, blacks, this is when strategy is over and pure tactic and pure calculation takes place. Bishop a3, queen takes a3, forced move, knight h5, well, forced move, pawn takes h5, queen g5, check, king f8, queen takes f6, check, the only move king g8, because on king e8, white simply mates black queen f7 and queen d7 checkmate. King g8, queen f7 check, and king h8. Here, uh, here is the position. After queen f7 check, after queen f7 check, king h8, there is not clear, there is well, you see, white cannot play queen f8 check because black simply will capture the queen. So in this position, we can repeat position, queen f6 and king g8. The best move would have been queen f7 check, king h8 in g3, and white easily escapes uh, with the king to h3. Uh, however, what uh, Botvinnik's plan worked also. He played e7, queen c1 check. It's obvious that black cannot stop white's e pawn, so their only hope in this position would be the perpetual check. King f2, queen c2 check. King g3, queen d3 check. King h4, queen e4 check. Now white plays king takes h5, queen e2 check, and after queen e2, king h4, queen e4, and now white plays g4, and after black gave queen e1 check and white went king h5, there are no more checks, and black cannot stop white from promoting e8, queen or playing queen f8, checkmate, Black resigned. This is actually a fascinating game. Both sides, top players in the world, they both have very good positional ideas. They had ideas. One side tried to get attack and uh, 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 capturing the center and attack on the king side. The other side tried to restrict and blockade. Both very interesting ideas and a very well played game by White. I would say it's not only my opinion, it's the opinion of the most of the players in the world that this is one of the best chess games that was ever played in history.